إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وخليله تركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك ولا ينتظم في سلكها إلا سالك اللهم صلي وسلم وأنعم وأكرم وبارك على حبيبنا وشفيعنا وملاذنا وقرة عيوننا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه في الأولين وصل وسلم وبارك عليه في الآخرين وصل وسلم وبارك عليه في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين يقول عز من قائل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون اللهم اجعلنا منهم يا رب العالمين اللهم أمين In the name of Allah the gracious, the merciful To him we belong and to him we shall return We ask Allah Jalla wa Ala In his infinite grace and boundless mercy To send an abundance of prayers and peace Upon our beloved messenger Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to engender within our hearts the love of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make prevalent in our hearts the desire to please Allah jalla wa ala, to live in this dunya as humble servants of Allah. May Allah make us amongst his ibad, his well-guided servants who will be happy in this life and the next. Allahumma ameen. And lastly, Allahumma taqabbal minna ramadanana. Oh Allah, accept our Ramadan. I know it sounds a little odd, many weeks after Ramadan has ended, to even mention Ramadan. And unfortunately, that has come to be the case in our Muslim communities, where once Ramadan ends, we simply forget. But our, our righteous predecessors, for them, Ramadan, as I said many times in the past, was the space that they orbited around. They lived around the month of Ramadan. Their year was of value because the month of Ramadan was central to their year. And so for six months after the conclusion of the month of Ramadan, they would say, Allahumma taqabbal minna Ramadanana. Oh Allah, accept our Ramadan. And the reason that is the case, brothers and sisters, the reason Ramadan is such an essential part of the ethos of the believer, such a central part to what it means to be a abd of Allah, a servant of Allah. It is because Ramadan showed us the absolute manifest beauty of Allah. His grace, His mercy, His generosity, His forgiveness. He showed us the beauty of worship, the beauty to come together in congregation, to pray our salawat, to fast the fast, to give charity, to make istighfar, to seek forgiveness, to make dhikr. We experience the beauty of worship. And so the companions knew that that was the spirit they needed that would propel them through the coming year. And so we have to remember the month of Ramadan. We must not forget. We must ask Allah every single day for the coming months that Allah accepts our Ramadan and then for the next six months after that, oh Allah, Bless us with another Ramadan. But one of the essential lessons that I want to touch upon from the month of Ramadan to help us navigate the realms of ubudiyah, the realms of servitude, is this notion that Allah taught us throughout the entire month. And that is the true spiritual capacity of the believer. Very often when we think about ibadah, when we think about worship, we think about it in very negative terms. That worship is so hard. To fulfill this ibadah is almost impossible. It really is profoundly difficult. And so therefore, I can't do. But what Allah showed us in Ramadan was our true spiritual capacity. He gave us some insight into what we are capable of. So He showed us that we do have the capacity to fulfill the ibadat. We have the capacity to restrict ourselves from the base human needs of food and drink. As I noted in previous khutab, 
for 30 days. We accomplish that bi fadlihi wa bi karamihi by his generosity and his mercy and his grace. But we accomplish those things. We prayed in a way that outside of Ramadan we're not accustomed to praying. But Allah showed us what we can accomplish. That worship is not an impossible hurdle to overcome. But with that said, it is no doubt that the circumstances that we live in as Muslims today can and are very challenging. They are. This is a given. When it comes to the impulses to fulfill the bestial desires, the nafsani desires, to attain all sorts of pleasures that we know are illicit and not good, the pressures to do that are very often overwhelming. And especially many of our young people and our elders feel those pressures. The pressures to engage in certain illicit behaviors with men or women. The pressures to engage in certain behaviors of drinking or consuming certain intoxicants or taking money that is not mine, that is not halal, that is not pleasing to Allah. But the pressures are so overwhelming sometimes that we buckle, we break. Add on top of all of those personal nafsani pressures that we see inundated with, we have to deal with issues of our identity. That very often we're struggling to worship Allah because Islam is viewed as this antiquated, old, retired type of behavior that it should be left in the dustbin of history. That Islam and all, any sort of religious practice is no longer relevant. It must be done away with. And that if you're someone who practices religion, you care about Allah, you care about following in the footsteps of Muhammad, you're viewed as being weird and odd. And that that behavior must be done away with. You need to stop holding on to your fairy tales. We hear regularly when it comes to practicing our Islam. And so very often in that landscape, it is hard to commit oneself to worship, to fulfill. It's definitely a challenge. When many are young people, their identities with regards to Islam are being compromised every single day because of that pressure. Peer pressure at school, at work, in the playground, wherever it may be. Why do you practice this thing? Why do you wear your hijab? Why do you not have a boyfriend? Why do you not have a girlfriend? Why do you not smoke this? Why do you not drink with us? Why don't you come to the club with us? Why don't you? Why don't you? And being under enough pressure makes you feel, well, is it really worth it? Do I have to really worship? It's just too hard. And yes, brothers and sisters, it is hard. But added on top of those challenges, we see the challenges of politics. We see the challenges of media. We see Islamophobia. We see what's happening to many of our brothers and sisters in war-torn lands across the world. And all of you know the names, the countries, the spaces, the places, the peoples that are being killed, pillaged, raped, and wronged, and oppressed by tyrannical forces every single day. We see what's happening from Syria to Burma to China to Africa to the Caucasus to the subcontinent, to the Middle East, we see it everywhere. And it's just adding darkness upon darkness, pressure upon pressure. And at times we feel we just can't do it anymore. And so the answer to the question, is worshiping Allah in difficult times hard? The answer is, yes, it is. It is a challenge. I'm not going to stand up here and say, it's a breeze, it's easy. What I'm going to say, yes, it is challenging. And I am not the one who's saying this, by the way. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the one who articulated to us in a hadith that I'll mention shortly, that worship during trialing times, by, during difficult times, is a challenge. But something that we have to understand about Allah that is very essential in our ubudiyah, in our servitude, in our relationship with Him. Because very often we get it wrong with Allah. There are people who, who tell us that God is only about good things and love. And God should, nothing about God should ever be difficult. And so if there's something about your relationship with God that's causing you some agitation, then God is the problem and not you. 
that, that, then your conception of God is wrong. That's very often one of the, the wrong pathologies that we have when thinking about Allah. We, we think about Allah in a way that we think about our friends who give us what we want or tell us what we want. Many of us, the reason why we continue in the behaviors that we have is because we're surrounded by people who encourage us to do those things. That if I have a relationship that I know is haram, that's illicit, with a guy or a girl, very often it's the people who are around me say, relax, it's the problem, it's just having a girlfriend, just having a boyfriend, why are you so uptight? Why is it such a big deal to you? Stop listening to, to those voices in your head that's saying that this is bad. Remove those barriers and just have fun. You're a young person, you're a young guy, you're a young girl. You're meant to have fun. You know, how come everyone else gets to have fun and you have to be all uptight and bothered and not have fun the way we have fun? So very often what's inhibiting us are those company, the company that we keep. And so very often when it comes to Allah, we think about Allah in the same exact light. All we want from Allah is that Allah accepts us for who we are and nothing else. We don't want Allah to challenge us. We don't want Allah to make asks of us. We just want Allah to be that enabling friend. But let me tell you something very categorical. Allah is not an enabler. Allah is not an enabler. Allah is not meant to be that friend that just gives you what you want or tells you what you want. So that you continue in that pathology that you yourself know is not good. When we commit a lot of these behaviors, we know are not appropriate, not good, not just in the sense of, you know, not do, doing what's haram or doing what's halal, but in the sense of I genuinely feel bad about my behavior. I don't feel good. It makes me feel depressed and, and full of anxiety. That very often what we need at that moment is not an enabling friend, but what we need is a loved one who truly cares for our well-being who will hold us and embrace us with the most loving embrace and say, let me show you how to live better. That if someone is afflicted with a type of addiction, alcoholism, drug addiction, pornography addiction, whatever the addiction is, you don't need someone around you who's just gonna simply entice you to continue to doing the same behavior. You need people around you who genuinely love you who want to pull that bottle away from you, to take those drugs away. Those who are, gonna, who are gonna be with you during trying times and during happy times. Those who are gonna be with you when you're really down and those who are gonna be with you when you're really up. Those who are gonna be sad with you and happy with you. But those who are gonna tell you, Ahmed, Muhammad, Khadija, Fatima, I need you to be at my home by 10 a.m. I need you to come and check up with me. Make sure that you're calling me up at 9 and 10 p.m. so that I know that you're home and you're not going to that same place. You're not hanging out with those same people that you know they're gonna take you down. That you're following your regimen, that you're fulfilling your schedule that was agreed upon. And sometimes that person who you know loves you the most is gonna have to be tough with you so that you wake up. Sometimes you're gonna have to pull the bottle away from you and you're not gonna like it. And it's going to be a challenge and it's going to be hard. But you know in the depth of your heart that that is what is good for me. Brothers and sisters, that is who Allah is for us. Allah is the most compassionate, the most merciful. He is Arhamur Rahimin. In the Rahmati Sabaqat Ghadabi, that my mercy precedes my wrath, Allah says. That ibadi inni an, anni an al rahim. Give glad tidings to my servants that verily I am the most forgiving. I am the most merciful. Yes, Allah is very much about love. And He loves His servants deeply. He loves us more than the mother loves the newborn child that is about to be harmed. And Allah is so close to us. But with all of that, for our well-being, Allah is making asks of us. Allah is telling us, that what is good for you is that no matter how challenging it may be, I need you to pray these five prayers a day. You must not miss the Fajr prayer. You must not miss it on time. Because what Allah is saying, from out of my deep love for you, my deep concern for you, my deep compassion for you, 
I need you to do these basic things so you can be a truly happy person, a truly carefree person, a truly comfortable person in this life, but much more importantly, in the afterlife. Allah is not our friend who is going to enable us. Allah is our beloved loved one, our friend who is going to challenge us to be the best. That's who Allah is for us. And so when we think about ibadah, we think about the challenge of worship, we think about the challenge of praying on time, we think about the challenge of paying zakah, we think about the challenge of not fulfilling that behavior, that illicit behavior with that person that we want to fulfill that behavior with, staying away from this money, from wearing the hijab, from doing these obligations, we do them knowing that yes, they're hard, but we know categorically this is what's best for us because our beloved Allahu Jalla wa Ala is the one who's asking us to do this and we trust him deeply. But brothers and sisters, it doesn't stop there. Just to illustrate the truly beautiful and inspirational quality of our deen. Because very often what inhibits us from growing in our, in our deen is that we've attached so many negative attributes to our religion. We've attached so many negative value propositions to the deen of Allah. We're always speaking about it in negative language. Whereas in, 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 in a very profoundly dominant way in the Quran and Sunnah, it is always in very positive language and in inspirational language. So back to what I said, is it hard to worship Allah in trying times? The answer is yes. And the Prophet ﷺ gave us very inspirational ahadith to hold on to. Especially when we're trying to navigate the times that we're navigating. The Prophet ﷺ says, Al-ibadatu fil fitnati ka hijratin ilayya. The Prophet ﷺ in a hadith that is narrated by Ma'qal ibn Yasar. And this hadith is found in all of the major collections of hadith from At-Tirmidhi. Abi Dawood, Ibn Majah, the Sunan of Imam Ahmad, this profoundly beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he says that the person who worships Allah in the times of fitna, in the times of difficulty, in the times of hardship, in the times of trials and tribulations, with all of the pressures that one faces, it is equal to a hijrah to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is equal to making that illustrious migration to our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Brothers and sisters, this is a very deep and profoundly inspiring hadith. Because what it tells us is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Allah jalla wa ala know what we're going through. They know how hard it will get to worship Allah. And so the Prophet is inspiring us and enticing us and saying, I know that you read the stories of the awaleen. You read the stories of the companions and how they made the hijrah from Mecca to Medina. That profound moment in the history of Islam that is so momentous and significant that the Muslim calendar, the, the Muslim calendar is known as the Hijri calendar because that was the moment of hijrah, migration, from that which a person is comfortable with or that which a person loves to that which Allah Jalla wa ala loves and that which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam embodied. That profound moment of hijrah, which is a dividing moment in our history. As Allah tells us, it is not equal the one who comes before the hijrah and the one who comes after because of the significance of that moment. Because it was those early committed believers through all of the hardships and difficulties who held on, they pushed through and they ended up with the sa'adah, the beauty and the bounties of Al-Madinah, Al-Munawwara, the city of lights, to be in the company of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so brothers and sisters, every single time you stand up to pray your salah, knowing the challenges that it takes you to stand up and pray, that you know very few people around you are praying, that you know very many people are judging you for your salah. But when you stand up in salah, you become inspired because you're saying, I am making a hijrah to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa 
when I stand up in my prayer, wherever I am in the world, I am a part of those, the Ummah of Muhammad that is migrating to him. The spiritual migration, not a physical migration, but a spiritual migration. That I'm able to leave behind my wants and my desires and my pleasures and my impulses and whatever peer pressure there is because I am fervent and I am confident on this path of La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. So the Prophet says, Al ibadatu fil fitna ka hijratin ilayya. It is the equivalent to make worship during times of difficulties. It is as if you are making a hijrah to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the Prophet does not stop there. In the ahadith that are so inspiring for us to commit ourselves to this religion, to know that the Prophet prophesized a time when the difficulties will be so immense. The Prophet ﷺ says to the companions one day as they were sitting, he says, Inna min wara'ikum ayyamu sabr. That verily beyond you, and he's referring to the companions, are ayyamu sabr. Days of patience. As sabru fi hinna kal qabdi ala al jamr. To be patient in worship during those times in those days is as if it is the one. It is like the one who's holding on to the hot coal. Kal qabdi ala al jamr. That to worship Allah in those times it is as if you're holding a hot coal. The Prophet ﷺ is telling the companions that there will come a time where worshipping Allah will be more difficult than the times that you're experiencing. Subhanallah. The Prophet is telling us, I know what you're going through. I know the feeling that you're feeling. I know that when you stand up to pray in the mall or you're praying in the airport, that those looks that are coming your way are burning you. I know that you feel the burn. Not Bernie Sanders, the other burn. I know that you feel the burn of the looks of people observing what you're doing. And you, are no, you know that there are people who are looking at you and they are deeply judging you. You know that there are people who are suspicious of you. Why are you doing that? Why are you praying like that? Suspicious. There are those who are looking at you and hate you. There are those who are looking at you and they are deeply curious. There are those who are looking at you and they quietly want to support you. There's all sorts of looks and so you're holding on to this hot coal. But as you're standing there, you know that the Prophet ﷺ is right there by your side supporting you for what you're doing. Because he said to the companions that that time will come. That yes, sometimes to wear the beard and to wear it proudly as a follower of Muhammad ﷺ, People don't like those beards. People in, in certain countries, they'll assess the length of your beard to know whether you're a friend or foe. Whether you're a good person or a bad person. Because if you wear your beard with pride, then there's question marks on you. But we wear the beard because it is pleasing to Allah and His Messenger Muhammad Regardless of the difficulty that we hold on to our name, Muhammad, we know that when people hear the name Muhammad, their mind goes into a thousand different directions. Should I hire this person? Should I fire this person? Should I befriend this person? Should I get close to this person? And so very often, what do we do? We buckle. The name Muhammad is a distraction. Forget it, my name is Mike. It's easier. It's gonna let me just kind of skate by and get by. But that's not what it's meant to be. As we said in the beginning of the khutbah, we will face challenges. And being close to Allah Jalla wa ala, the most gracious, the most merciful, can be challenging. But it's a challenge that we can handle. And that's what Ramadan taught us. That we can handle that hot coal that we're holding in our hand. That the hand of the believer can be like an ice cube as it's holding on to that hot coal. That no matter how difficult it gets, we're not going to drop it. Because we love Allah Jalla wa ala. And we know where our, our salvation lies. But the Prophet ﷺ does not stop there. Just to show you how inspirational our scripture must be to our hearts and our minds and our souls. He tells the companions in that same narration. He says, عِبَادَةُ أَحَدِهِمْ 
that the worship of one of them, referring to the people who come in trying times, referring to us, it will be equal to the ibadah of khamsina, 50 of equal actions that are done in previous times. And so the companions out of astonishment say, Ya Rasulullah, it is the equivalent of 50 of them, meaning 50 of us, like one of us to 50 of us, or one of us to 50 of the companions. So the Prophet Sallallahu says, Bal minkum, 50 of you. That the person who worships Allah during the most trying times, when every single pressure in society is telling you, stop being a Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu is saying that you worship in those times. It is equal to 50 companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is more inspirational than that? What tells us so clearly Allah knows what we are experiencing, what we are facing, and He is giving us profound reward, telling us that when you stand up and you fulfill my obligations, when you get out of that toxic relationship that you have with your boyfriend of your girlfriend, no matter how hard it is on you, but when you fulfill that command, it is equal to the ibadah, to the worship of 50 companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Brothers and sisters, we must begin to attach these beautifully positive, inspirational qualities of our religion to our worship. We must embrace the challenge as a beautiful challenge that will only beget greater goodness for us in our lives. Because Allah Jalla wa Ala looks to those amongst the few who hold on to his deen when everyone is forgetting. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the reasons that he used to love to make Siyam, to fast in the month of Sha'ban, because he says, Thaka Shahrun Yaful Anhu Kathirum Minanas. The reason why the Prophet ﷺ used to fast the way he fasted in the month of Sha'ban, just to teach a lesson, is because he says in that month many people are forgetful, are heedless. And I want Allah Jalla to see me fasting as my actions are presented to Him in these moments where very few are practicing. There is a particular virtue, brothers and sisters, to being a person of ibadah, a person of worship, when very few others are doing that. Because I know one of the great complaints that many of us feel, especially when it comes to practicing our religion, we say, well, everyone else is doing X. How come I have to do Y? But you know what? X is not equal to Y. This is not algebra. <laughs> this is not calculus. Why is Allah? So there is no la yastawi, there is no equality between what is pleasing to Allah and what people do. Because what people do is arbitrary, but what Allah wants us to do is absolutely virtuous. And it will always be better than anything else. And so when you ask yourself that question, how come I'm the only one who has to do this? You make the dua of the person who was standing next to Sayyidina Umar when he raised his hands and he said, Allahumma ja'alni min ibadika al qaleel. And Sayyidina Umar grabbed him. <laughs> As Sayyidina Umar would do, he said, Why are you making this dua? I've never heard the Prophet make this dua. This dua is, Oh Allah, make me amongst your few servants. Ibadika al qaleel. So Umar said, Where did you get this hadith? Where did you get this dua from? And so, Sayyidina, so the man said to Sayyidina Umar, he said, didn't Allah Jalla wa Ala in the Qur'an say, وَقَلِيلٌ مِنْ عِبَادِيَ الشَّكُورِ It is only a few of my servants who are truly thankful. So I ask Allah, Allahumma ja'alni min ibadika al-qaleel. Oh Allah, make me amongst your few servants. Sayyidina Umar's response to the man was, كُلُّ النَّاسِ أَفْقَهُ مِنْ عُمَر All people are more knowledgeable than Umar. That the hikmah, the wisdom of this man to understand that when Allah in the Qur'an speaks about the qillah, it is those few who are committed to Allah. 
But when Allah speaks in the Quran about kathra, about annas, it is very often that the majority of people, as Allah says in the Quran, are forgetful. The majority of people are not thankful. The majority of people are X. And so brothers and sisters, young of old today, as you worship Allah in this day and age, you should have a sense of honor that you are amongst the qaleel. And yes, it is supposed to be that there will be a few who are committed. And it's not odd that you are the only one in your class whose name is Muhammad. It's not odd that you are the only one in your school who wears hijab. That's your badge of honor. It is not odd that you're the only one in your office space who says, I'm not going to go to happy hour to drink with my coworkers because I know that's not pleasing to Allah. We don't say, I just want to fit in. We say, in mercy and in compassion and in love for our brothers and sisters in humanity, we say, I'm a Muslim. I don't engage in those behaviors. I don't do this. It's not being judgmental. It's not being condescending. It's being someone who upholds the way of La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. And so yes, it is hard to be the only one who's a Muslim in your classroom. It is difficult. Wallahi, I understand it is difficult. As someone who was a student in a Catholic school where myself and my brother were only two Muslims in the sea of 1,000 Catholic school boys, I know the challenge of holding on to one's Islam. But I also know that the virtue of being amongst the qaleel is so profound that I know that when I hold on to my ibadah, Allah will elevate me to the highest of heights. And that I will truly be happy in this dunya and the next, no matter how great the challenge is in this dunya. And lastly, brothers and sisters, in conclusion, the Prophet ﷺ says in a profoundly beautiful hadith that I know everyone knows. But let me remind myself and you of this hadith in these moments. The Prophet ﷺ says, بَدَأَ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا طُوبًا لِلْغُرَبًا that Islam started estranged. Islam started as a strange matter in the Arabian Peninsula. It was not accepted, it was rejected, it was odd, it was hated. How are you doing that which our forefathers did not do? How could you do this and how could you do that? It was estranged. The Prophet ﷺ says it started that way and it will come back at some point to be estranged once again. وَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَ and the glad tidings are for those who are strange. And so yes, as Muslims, we may be strange, but Tuba lil You know, I say to people very often, if it's weird to be Muslim, then I'm the number one weirdo. I'm the biggest weirdo of all. And that is how I want to meet Allah Jalla wa As an American Muslim, I am proud of my Islam, no matter how weird it looks to people. And that a part of the American fabric is this weird thing called Islam. This strange thing called Islam. Sha'a man sha'a wa abba man abba. The ones who welcome it, alhamdulillah, and the ones who reject it, may Allah guide their hearts. May Allah help us to hold on to our Islam, no matter how difficult it is. May Allah make us amongst those who fulfill our ibadat. May Allah make us a people who love to pray our five salawat. May Allah make us a people who love to fast our Ramadan. May Allah make us a people who love to pay our zakah. May Allah people make us a people who love to make hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us a people who love to recite the Quran. May Allah make us a people who love to be in His remembrance. May Allah make us a people who love to purify their hearts of arrogance and all of the diseases of the heart. May Allah help us to stay away from the prohibitions, no matter how many few they may be. May Allah help us to stay away from the behaviors we know are displeasing to Him. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد 
Brothers and sisters, many of us have been watching the news in the past week, observing what is happening in Al Masjid Al Aqsa, the sacred sanctuary of the believers, of the Muslims. And brothers and sisters, allow me to take a moment to reflect upon what is happening there. Please, don't come to me after the khutbah and say, what about my country? I know, wallahi I know. And I know the pains that so many people across the world are facing. And I try in all of my khutbah to remember as many of the countries as I can. Because I know the hardships are far and wide. Allow me to indulge for a moment the cause of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and the plight of the Palestinian people. Allow me to reflect on that for a moment, not because of political desires, not because of nationalistic pursuits, but because of our love for Allah Jalla wa Ala and because of our reverence of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because for too long, the topic of Palestine, the topic of Palestine and the topic of Masjid Al-Aqsa has been mired in a toxic and ugly political discourse. The issue of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is a matter of our theology. The Masjid Al-Aqsa, brothers and sisters, is ula al-qiblataini wa thani al-haramain. It is the first qibla of the Muslims. The Muslims, when they stand up to pray, when the prayer was first obligated, the direction that we faced was Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa in Palestine. The second of the sacred sanctuaries that were built on this earth where Allah Jalla wa Ala was to be worshipped and praised is Al Masjid Al Aqsa. Al Masjid Al Aqsa and the lands of Al Masjid Al Aqsa are the place of Al Mahshar, the place of gathering and the place of resurrection. Al Masjid Al Aqsa is the space and the place where the, the magnificent and miraculous. Elevation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Mi'raj of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam happened. Subhanallah Asra bi Abdihi Layla min al Masjid al Harami ila al Masjid al Aqsa alladhi barakna hawla. Al Masjid al Aqsa is the sacred and blessed land where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam led 124,000 prophets and messengers in congregational prayer, where he was then elevated to be beyond a Siddhartul Muntaha to be in the company of Allah Jalla wa Ala. Brothers and sisters, Masjid Al-Aqsa is not a nationalistic or political pawn to be put in the hands of political players, Muslim or non-Muslims. This is a matter of our deen for us. We love Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. We love Al-Ka'ba Al-Musharrafa. We love al Madina Al-Munawwara. And we love Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. It is sacred to us. It means everything to us. And we must not be quieted by the fears of why are you talking about Palestine? Because so many of us have been rendered mute out of fears that if you talk about Palestine, it's AKA for something else. That it's synonymous with something else. No. For us, we love Al Masjid Al Aqsa. It is a blessed land. And what's happening that for the first time in so many years, for Salatul Jumu'ah, for the Friday prayer that we're praying right now to, to not happen, for the Masjid Al-Aqsa to be closed down, where no Salatul Jumu'ah happened, is abomination to Islam and Muslimi. This tears our hearts apart. It breaks the heart of the believer to see Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa mired in this circumstance. It tears the soul apart. Put aside all of the political circumstances. Put aside all of the nationalistic tendencies. Put aside all of that toxic rhetoric. Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa is about Allah and His Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when the believer sees what is happening to those sacred spaces, that the boots of soldiers are crawling or walking on those spaces, it breaks the soul of the believer. And this is something we have to say confidently. And let me name it so no one thinks anything weird. We are not calling for terrorism. We're not calling for bloodshed. We're not calling for the eradication of a people. We're calling for justice. We're calling for dignity. Because when the land, when the sacred spaces of Muslims are desecrated in that way, 
It pains us and it hurts us. This is a conversation we need to have with our politicians. This is a conversation we need to have with our co-workers. This is a conversation we need to have with our Jewish interfaith and our Christian interfaith. And tell them how pained we are by this. And that Muslims will not stay quiet on the plight of the Palestinians. That this is a matter that concerns us deeply and spiritually. So brothers and sisters, the most essential thing, the most essential lesson for all of us is do not forget. Do not be mindless of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Do not be heedless to the plight of our brothers and sisters in that area. Beyond the political discourse, and I know there is so much to be said politically about what is happening there. And I'm, I'm talking beyond that point. I'm talking from a spiritual point. Because if spiritually I am forgetful of the sacred house of Allah Jalla wa Ala, where the prayer in Masjid Al-Aqsa is equal to 500 prayers, if I'm neglectful of that, then what does my relationship with Allah really look like? ذَلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those who make grandiose and who honor the rites and the rituals of Allah Jalla wa Ala and that which Allah has deemed sacred. And no matter who the regime is, Muslim or non-Muslim, Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ مَنَعَ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُذْكَرَ فِي هَسْمُهُ and the wrong and the, 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 the greatest of oppressors and wrongdoers are who prevent the house of Allah Jalla wa Ala to have Allah's name remembered there. And so for the believers in those lands to be prevented to pray in their sacred spaces because of toxic politics, because of provocative measures, that is something the Muslims must find a problem with. And so my advice to myself and all of my brothers and sisters care about Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Make dua for Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and the lands of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Talk to your friends, talk to your co-workers, talk to your interfaith alliances and organizations, talk to your representatives and say what is happening pains me as an American Muslim. It deeply harms me to see what is happening. And I cannot be quiet on this issue. And I will not be silenced by intimidation or fear tactics to, to make the Muslim community forget about Palestine or to forget about Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. We will not forget. Because it is too precious to Allah and His Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for us to forget or neglect it. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala bless and protect our brothers and sisters in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. May Allah protect our sacred sanctuaries. May Allah protect the honor of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and the honor of Al-Masjid Al-Haram in Al the Kaaba Al-Musharrafa and Medina Al-Munawwara. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala make us a people who love this deen. May Allah make us a people who are true agents of mercy and compassion in society. May Allah make us a people who pursue justice in all of its corners, whether for, more, for Muslims or for non-Muslims. May Allah make us a people of righteousness and goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve this Islam in our hearts because we know the goodness Islam has in store for this world. May Allah make us people who follow truly in the footsteps of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us on this day of Jumu'ah. May he have mercy on all of the lands of this world where innocence is being provoked and innocence is being harmed where there is oppression may Allah remove the oppression from upon them in Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsani wa ita'i dhil qurba wa yanha 'anil fahsha'i wal munkari wal baghi ya'idhukum la'allakum tadhakkarun wa la dhikrullahi akbar wallahu ya'lamu ma tasna'un aqimus